Okay, um, welcome to the Arc of California workshop on supported decision making. You don't have to get conservatorship. I would like to introduce and tell you a little bit about your guest speaker, Suzanne Bennett Francisco. She provides education and advocacy services to people with disabilities and their families for KPS 4P, um, for parents, Knowledge Power Solution for parents. A 501 nonprofit advocacy organization as a current law student at Golden Gate University School of Law. Suzanne heads KPS outreach and supported decision making, is a nationally published and recognized writer on the subject and provides in-person and web-based information and training. She currently partners the Arc of California and the Burton Blatt Institute of Cypress University with a in a with grant supported project to provide education and training in supported decision making to people with disabilities, families, teachers, case managers, providers, and other agency professionals throughout California. In her direct advocacy work, Suzanne specializes in the assistance and empowerment of individuals with exceptional abilities with a wide variety of diagnosis and needs, and their families to navigate systems within which appropriate supports and services can be provided either educationally through a free appropriate public education, FAPE, and or in their community, as well as to preserve their, di their disability rights. As a mother to three with the special needs myself, she is persistent and family with the challenges of individuals and families face in negotiating to meet the needs of, their, of either themselves or loved ones. Suzanne is a COPAA Council of Parents, Attorneys, and Advocates and SMP Silicon Valley Special Needs Professional member. Uh, moreover, she works with the State of Council for Developmental Disabilities and others as part of an advisory committee to develop the independent facilitator training. A part of California's self-determination program, <clears throat> Susan participates in the THINK Transition Network led by the UC Davis Mind Institute. A CEDD Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. She is post-22 committee member charged with the development of an, of an choice-driven adult program in service to those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Suzanne has been extremely honored to collaborate with other agencies such as the National Resource Center and Supported Decision Making. The State Council on Developmental Disabilities, the National ACLU, the Mind Institute, and Disability Rights California. Her pride and joy come from seeing individuals, their supporters, and her own children thrive after what has been in inevitably an often unpredictable, challenging, and enriching <coughs> journey that begins for each of us with a passionate heart, hard work, determination, and persistence. Okay, Suzanne, come take over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, good morning. I'm just gonna slide this back for a moment. So welcome, thank you for being here today and for taking the time out and being the kind of people who empower people with disabilities. They are our teachers. Um, let me get out of the way here. So uh, I am a disability rights advocate with KPS for Parents, as Renee mentioned, and I have the pleasure and the honor of uh, working on this grant project that was sponsored by the With Foundation, working for inclusion and transformative healthcare. And WIT's mission is in alignment with my partners, which are the ARC of California, Executive Director uh, Gordon Lindsay, and also uh, Jonathan Martinez, the Senior Director of Law and Public Policy for the Burton Blatt Institute in Washington, DC. And so what we have in common is our mission, which is for human rights and inclusion. And so you may say, okay, what is supported decision making? Why am I here? And why does it matter? And I'm gonna start just by telling you my story. I grew up as a sister of a young woman with uh, juvenile diabetes and bipolar. 
and we found out that she was diabetic uh, at age 12. And then later on, we found out that she was also bipolar. So she was in and out of hospitals uh, all of her life. She was in ICU very young, and she became blind um, around age 28. Um, she lost a limb, she was in a wheelchair, and her organs shut down slowly but surely, every single one. Um, and by the end of her life, she was hallucinating quite a bit. But she was the spunkiest self-advocate uh, her entire life. She was a medical assistant, she was a phlebotomist. Her goal was to be a nurse. So she was very um, involved and passionate when she was in the hospital. She wanted to learn everything about what was happening. And so, lo and behold, I'm an advocate in California. She's a self-advocate in Washington, and she ended up in a group home. Um, and it was a nursing home, really, for seniors. And so when I got there, I, I went down the last hallway of the last row in the last room, and literally looking down the aisle of beds, she is the last bed. And for a small portion of the time, there was one other person in that room. And there were people in wheelchairs along the hallway waiting for someone to come and bring them some attention. And so, of course, I was alarmed by that, and um, it took a lot of work between myself and my sister to get her out of that group home. And the good news is that she ended up in an adapted apartment. She had the supports and services that she needed to be independent, to have a flat screen TV and watch what not to wear. Uh, and I remind you, she was blind, and she would say, that is so ugly. Um, <laughs> she, was, uh, she was very passionate and a joy, and this enabled her to go to the hospitals and be um, a mentor for young women uh, who were, and boys who were discovering that they were diabetics. So she felt like she lived a pers purposeful life, and um, I was happy that we were able to do that. Um, later on, she was on hospice, and uh, this was at age 43. And her whole life, her dream was to donate her body to science. And so I was just baffled that she hadn't done anything to make that happen. And I knew that was the most important thing for her, to donate her body to science. And so I am currently a law student. I cannot tell you how I pulled this off, but somehow I did. I got her body donated to science. And that's one of my proudest moments. And um, you can imagine that kind of a decision for my mother just couldn't happen. So I was really happy that I was on her team. I was part of her circle of support. And I was able to make her dream come true. And so um, that's where I began. And then um, to my surprise, I ended up having uh, children with disabilities. So I have three children uh, with congenital muscular dystrophy and autism, and they are sassy, they are nonverbal, they are cunning, they reprogram their AAC devices if we are not listening. Um, they have intellectual disability, um, and they are my joy, and they're why I'm here today and why I'm speaking to you. So, um, you ask perhaps why my children might reprogram their devices, and it's because they're age 19, 18, and 15, and they have a voice, and they have an opinion, and they would like it to be heard. So they're, they're typical teenagers. Um, so why I'm here today is because we all have the same purpose in common. We're all here to empower people with disabilities um, and to talk about human rights. And so you say, does it matter? It does. It does matter. So uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my son. My, my son is the middle child. And I used to walk around my house talking to myself, asking questions all day long, kind of rhetorical questions. And often I truly thought they didn't know the answer to a lot of this question, these questions or what it was that I was talking about. And so one day I was sitting on my son's bed and I was talking to him 
And I asked a question and he shook his head, yes, for the first time. But it was such a question, I said, no, he can't possibly know what I just asked. And so I asked in many different ways and I discovered he knew exactly what I was talking about and he was answering the question, yes. And I have to tell you that my middle son has had the most behavior and he's had the hardest time coping and communicating. And it was quite a light bulb moment for me to uh, stop thinking that I know what they're thinking all the time and what they can comprehend. So we want to be uh, open to new thinking today. And I think if my job is well done, it will be that you have a different perspective and that you're thinking differently and, and hopefully acting on that in the lives of people with disabilities. Um, so think about a person in your life that you make decisions for. Um, and what decisions are those? What do they look like? Are they decisions that the individual could be making for themselves? So every human has the right to communicate and express themselves and to know how to communicate and to know that they can communicate. And um, so many times I see amazing parents and individuals and I'm very passionate about communication. Um, I think it's very important that we empower them to speak. Um, so if you're thinking about even a typical child, a two-year-old child, um, the amount of decisions that a typical family would make for a young child, uh, choices that we just automatically do that. You know, we make decisions for other people that they could be making for themselves. And so everyone benefits when everyone has the ability to make choices. And I think being cognizant of that and thinking about that throughout your day and throughout the time that you're spending with your individual and saying, what decisions could this person make? What choice could they make? That's all we're talking about, choices. So I am my choices. I cannot not choose. If I do not choose, that is still a choice. If I do not choose, that is still a choice. Faced with the inevitable circumstances, we still choose how we are in those circumstances. So study after study has shown that increased self-determination has improved psychological health and their better adjustment to increased care needs. People who exercise self-determination have a better quality of life, increased independence, and more community integration. So rights equals choice, choice equals self-determination. This is about life control and being a causal agent in their lives. And for exceptional people, they're often acted upon instead of having any kind of control in their lives. So guardianship um, is what we're here to talk about today. And one thing I did not mention is that I am a non-attorney. I do not practice law. Everything in this presentation has been informed by an attorney, several attorneys. Um, and I also wanna make sure that you all know that this is about um, a change in culture and a change of information, education, and knowledge that wasn't available before. This is not about vilifying anyone um, around guardianship. It's about doing what we do everywhere else in our lives, which is looking at the least restrictive options and looking at what options are available there. And you know, at one time we only had institutions, now we have other choices. So this is not about vilifying anybody, it's about educating people to let them know that we have more choice today and we should look at those options first. So, um, so guardianship, most guardianships are either plenary or full guardianships. That is where the guardian will make all the decisions for that person. Um, and again, the vast majority of those cases, uh, guardianship cases, are full or plenary, and the courts prefer to use it. And so if we're looking at best practices everywhere in the world of disability, best practices is least restrictive, restrictive options. And um, I'll tell you, I was working on a case for a conservatee who 
uh, was contesting the conservatorship and was not represented by the public defender. Um, the public defender was representing the conservator. Um, she was recommended for an independent living program and supported by many people um, who came to testify and, and be a witness um, because she's not the type of person that you would see conserved. She was speaking at schools and colleges, high schools, and um, talking about Project R. Um, and also, even the regional center assessment recommended that she have three or four of those rights back. And we didn't feel that that was complete. And so um, what happened in that case, we went and we had uh, an opportunity to have witnesses te testify. And then before other assessments were complete, before other witnesses testified, before any of that happened, the judge posted something online and it was his decision. The decision would be that the assessments would not be completed, and before the witnesses testified, all seven powers. So they, they changed the name to a limited conservatorship from a full conservatorship, and against the regional center's assessment, which really, to be honest with you, was not thorough. It didn't really represent her personality or her interests. Um, even that recommended that she have three or four rights, and the end result was that all seven rights were given to the conservator who um, basically took her away from that program and moved her away. So I think that sometimes people don't realize the, um, the impact of guardianship and really when you're conserving somebody, you're saying that the conservator could be the court because the court can say you are an inappropriate conservator and I'm going to assign an unbiased person to be the conservator for you. Um, and in those cases, they often don't know anything about disability. They have lots of cases on their desk. And um, it's a very sad situation when that happens. So that's why it's really important that we learn about other options and that we don't jump to guardianship. Um, as a result, guardians have substantial and often complete authority over people who are vulnerable. They make their basic, most basic decisions, health, personal, and financial decisions. And these come down to decisions of, for people who are conserved that tell stories that they just want to go to a different place to eat or they want to have some other choices in their life. Just, it's the simple things, the simple choices that you make that can have a really big impact. Somebody who wants to get their ears pierced. Um, and we'll talk about how that feels and the impact on people's lives. So when denied self-determination, people feel helpless, often feel helpless, hopeless, and self-critical. They experience low self-esteem. Overwhelmingly, they have feelings of inadequacy and incompetency. And this is in a study here. Um, that has been conducted. So women with intellectual disabilities exercising more self-determination are more able to resist and recognize abuse. In study after study, they talk about self-determination and the effects of having increased, increased self-determination in your life. And so I really encourage people to contrive situations and think about how we can take teach skills. And in the case of my daughter, we contrived a situation where we had the greatest guy, like comedian, harmonica player. He's just a wonderful guy. Anybody would get in his car. I was thinking I would get in his car. So we had him pull up in front of the house. Um, I'm sorry if I'm in your way. <laughs> uh, we had him pull up in front of the house and say, come on, Kylie, get in. And I thought, for sure, she's going to get in that car. Nope. She waved her hand, and she ran to me, and she got her device, and she said, Mom, Mom, Mom. She was telling me about it. So um, there are many ways that we can contrive situations, and we can offer people support. If somebody's going on a date, they're going to meet a new person. They can have somebody sitting there in the coffee shop. They could have somebody sitting outside the coffee shop. They could be texting. There are ways that we can teach people when you're in a situation, what do you do? That's 
that's um, the most important thing, to have self-expression and to practice these skills, to have routines. And of course, if somebody's using AAC, if it's not in their AAC device, they're not going to be able to say it. And I understand having three children with disabilities that use AAC devices, programming them is, um, it, it takes a commitment to do that. But can you imagine how can they keep themselves safe if they're not able to speak and say what it is they need to say to, to be safe? So um, it's really important to program everything into the AAC device, including uh, your outfit is not working for me. You know that there is everything in those uh, board maker programs. And so I've looked uh, quite, quite a few things up and I was thinking that is what my daughter would tell me. That outfit is not working for me. So the benefits of self-determination are that people are healthier, they're more independent, they're shown to be better adjusted and better able to recognize and resist abuse. And people with intellectual disabilities that do not have a guardian, this was in a study specifically on people with intellectual disabilities and those that had a guardian and those that did not. And the people that did not have a guardian were more likely to have a paid job live independently, to have friends outside of their staff and their family, and to go on dates, to socialize, and to practice the religion of their choice. And we're gonna talk about a case where that actually happened, where a person was uh, taken away from her job, put into a group home, and she was a very loving, uh, church-going person, and she was no longer allowed to go to the church that she went to her entire life. So. These things are important. So where do we go from here? Guardianship may be needed in the case of uh, emergencies, if somebody's incapacitated. Um, there can be, uh, if they're not able to provide consent for a power of attorney, advanced directive, uh, people who face critical decisions and aren't able to make decisions. Um, so. The National Council on Disabilities in 2018 did a study on guardianship, and this is rare and very exciting to have this information. And so as we're looking at um, deciding that somebody needs to be conserved, and how do we know that they can't make those decisions? How do we know that they're incapacitated? And what have we tried first before we jump to a decision to have guardianship. So what they found was that states were missing data on conservatorships, and that's without a doubt. There isn't data about what happens to the people with guardian. There's not enough uh, data. And people with disabilities are widely underestimated in their decision-making abilities. I gave you the example of a conservatee. I think it's just so automatic for some people, and uh, guardianship is seen as a kindness. We're helping this person out, we're being well-meaning. And so these decisions are made very quickly and we need to realize the impact of those decisions and really investigate and empower people, provide them support. So the rights of people with disabilities are often not protected during guardianship proceedings, which I sh shared with you. Um, and I can't impress upon you that uh, enough. Um, I was talking to an advocate in Michigan and he was telling me that in Michigan, if you're getting conserved, every uh, court hearing is about two minutes long. Hello, what's your name? Okay, you're conserved. Um, and it's, it's, we need to just slow down and take a look at what we're doing. Um, so people doing capacity assessments are, not, are often not properly trained um, and we really emphasize that doing a functional assessment of someone, someone, what choices they make, what do they do in their life every day. We're not talking about IQ assessments. We're talking about how does this person function able, every day? What choices can they make? Um, so courts often do not properly oversee conservators to make sure they are not taking advantage of their authority. And I know, for example, in Santa well, I shouldn't say that I know, but there are counties nearby where attorneys have told me that most of the time the court is supposed to come back out at once a year. And in most cases, in many attorneys' experience, 
they, they don't come out and do that. They don't have the funds to do that. So if it was a guardianship of an estate, they're more likely to come out and um, check on people. So most states re require trying less restrictive options, but often do little to enforce this requirement. And that is true. We're gonna give you a lot of information today and we really need um, all of us to be bringing all this information to judges, to attorneys, to case managers, to teachers. People just don't have the information. And that case that I just gave you as an, as an example was in California, and there is a stipulation that there should be least restrictive options considered before a person is conserved. Um, but there is no mention of that often. Every state has a process to end guardianships, but this process is rarely used and can be complex, confusing, and expensive. And we'll give you an example of a case where parents said, hey, I don't think my child needs to be conserved anymore. And the court said, no, we're gonna keep them conserved. So uh, I have literally seen an example of an attorney who uh, does videos, he's, that is very much like a car salesman. And he says, oh, you can just change your mind and do something different um, if they grow and they're, they have more abilities later. And that is not the case. It's very difficult to exit a conservatorship. So guardianship is never needed because you have an IQ of X. Uh, it's never needed because you're sick, because you need help. We all need help because that's the way it's always been or because it's for your own good. And I'm telling you, the last time somebody said it's for your own good, I was not very happy and I don't think I was very excited about what was gonna happen next. So, um, and I do wanna also mention um, in terms of IQ, there's a gentleman named Dan Habib and he is traveling the country and um, sharing a film called Intelligent Lives and I had the uh, opportunity to meet him and his son and it is about his son and their ability to work and be independent in the community and how important it is that we're not always referring to IQ and that we look at people's abilities. So the National Guardianship Association, their sole purpose is all about guardianship and their recommendation and I apologize this needs to be updated. They. They also have a position statement dated 2017. And they say that alternatives, including supported decision-making, should always be considered prior to conserving or proceeding with guardianship proceedings. So research talks about the negative impact on the mental health and the ability to function and the person's well-being. So we know self-determination means increased quality of life. We know that people need more support as they age when they have disabilities. We know that guardianship can result in a decreased quality of life. And so we wanna move forward uh, to some different ideas. So a way forward is supported decision-making. And supported decision-making is a recognized alternative to guardianship where family, friends, professionals help them understand the situations and choices they make so that they can make their own decisions to the maximum of their own unique abilities. So just think about it. How do you make decisions? What do you do when you're making decisions about your taxes or you're making decisions about going to the mechanic or making decisions about going to the auto repair. So we're gonna go find an expert, find a professional. We're gonna say, I have no idea how to fix my car. I hate my taxes, I hate numbers. Um, and in medical care, we go to the doctor, we say, you know, I need some help, and we may not understand what he's saying to us, and we ask him to interpret it for us so that we can understand and make better decisions. And we are seen as doing a great thing. We're knowledgeable, we're, we're respected for doing that. And wouldn't that be nice if people with disabilities got the same respect for asking for the help that they need?
So a supported decision-making team is basically a circle of support. Um, and really, I, I want to impress upon you, my feeling as a parent is immediately that I am not alone. And I hear all the time, and I felt myself, the weight of feeling like I'm alone. And we have to figure out what to do um, with people with disabilities and how to help them. And when you have a circle of support, you aren't alone, and there is a clear, um, there is a clear purpose, an unbiased purpose to help this person have maximum independence and to be self-expressed and to know about the individual. So that really brings peace of mind to me. So where do we go from here? Um, if people can only make decisions and choices with assistance or support, are they incapacitated? And are you? If you can only make decisions with su support, some of your decisions, are you incapacitated? So what else have we tried? So there are opportunities for supported decision-making everywhere. There are student-led IEPs and person-centered plans. There's informed consent in medical care, informed choice in vocational rehabilitation, and in end-of-life planning, the conversation, and the five wishes. So supported decision-making can help people understand the information that they're presented with, help them to focus attention, to weigh options, to ensure that decisions are based on their own preferences and have interpretation. Uh, and really, I look at it as an accommodation. We're going to have a supported decision-making team meeting, and what is it that my individual needs to prepare for that meeting, what accommodations do they need there, and we're going to take questions at the end. Sorry. Thank you. Um, please write it down, because I do want to answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier, and I, I'm happy you asked that question so I can uh, say that again. Um, this is a chock full um, workshop, and uh, it's a boot camp. So there is a lot of information, and I assure you, you will get copies of these slides. You should also have a note-taking pages, note-taking pages in there with some titles of some of the uh, areas we're going to talk about. And please make sure you write down any questions that you have. You will have all of these slides sent to you afterwards. And the reason we didn't distribute them is because there are 246. There is a lot of information today. So you will have all of it. And it's very good, powerful information for you to have um, going forward. Um, OK. So I'm with you. I'm visual. I like to write. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Um, so supported decision-making is a framework. It is not a one-size-fits-all. It is very much like an IEP or an IPP. You don't want them all to look the same. And in fact, if somebody says, I've got a one-size-fits-all supported decision-making agreement, you should go the other way. Um, and basically, we do have model forms. And those are used to help you start um, and see where, where you're going to go. But it should be very unique and tailored to your person. So um, they have informal support. You can have a written supported decision-making agreement. Uh, there are powers of attorney and circles of support. So we're going to talk about transition service, special education, and human rights. So we know about IDEA, and that empowers us to ensure that children with disabilities have special education uh, and related services to meet their unique needs to prepare them for future employment, independence, and education. So guardianship is still the default option for students with intellectual disability, and school personnel are the most frequent source of recommendations. And so I'm going to say, and I say this as an advocate um, doing direct work, that people relay to you what they're given and the information that they're given and the information that people in schools have gotten for years and continue to get is that people with disabilities should be conserved and there is a feeling of fear 
that conserving somebody is going to keep them, somehow keep them safe, and that that is the only option. And even now, as we have options, we're continuing to educate people so that they know about that. So guardianship happens when people are not able to take care of themselves according to society's expectations and what they believe is appropriate. So independent living skills are self-care skills, organization, communication, and interpersonal skills. Um, learning to take care through special education. So students who have special education are more likely to be successful in their transition to adulthood into employment and independent living outcomes. Um, and self-determination is a best practice in education. At special education, and I'm happy to share with you the uh, Department of Education's new transi transition guide that came out in January 2017, and if you look at the definition of self-determination, it is exactly what Waymeyer says, um, who's a very profound and um, person that informs us about self-determination. I skipped forward a little bit here. So there are some cases that have come to light recently. One of them is Andrew. Um, this case went to the Supreme Court, and the court held that uh, goals for IEP should be appropriately ambitious, and that people in special education classrooms should have challenging objectives. And so many times, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been in an IEP meeting where success is two out of five and 50% of the time. And, uh, you know, having very specific, meaningful goals that really reflect, reflect what that person wants going forward in the future and that are ambitious is important. Um, the other case, which um, is actually in Tennessee, Michigan, Kentucky, and Ohio, was a case um, called LH. It was very recently, and they said that um, this young man who had Down syndrome um, sh belongs, and they are included, and we are better for it. And so this is very exciting. Um, we can use this precedent in California. And I also reference uh, Charmaine Thanner here. She is an educational advocate, and she has a Facebook page. She has a website called Visions and Voices, and she has a lot of information about inclusion and generally about education. It's very helpful. So learning to take care through uh, special education, um, making decisions and advocating for themselves, having the opportunity to exercise these skills. Um, students who have reached 18 years of age may receive support from another competent and willing adult to aid them in their decision making. So the first thing I think of is number one, we very rarely have these goals where we're talking about problem solving and self-advocacy. And secondly, exercising them. How are we gonna accomplish this goal? What, what is this person gonna do interacting with their peers in the general education population? That's very important. And we're gonna be talking about schools in DC. So in Washington, DC, there is a district that has supported decision-making started starting in preschool. So they are learning problem-solving skills and decision-making at a very young age, um, and it's really great to see that. So creating and reaching those goals. We can have student-led IEPs where they identify the goals and objectives, and they participate to the maximum of their unique abilities. And I want to reiterate that. We're, we're giving you guidelines here, and every person is different, and I believe every person has an opportunity to, um, to participate. And I think I, I can confess personally that I have thought that there are students that couldn't participate in their IEP with intellectual disability. And I was surprised. I had a student, I thought they would be able to participate for about five minutes, and they participated for an hour and a half. And it was really empowering for them to hear the strengths, um, what their strengths were, and that they asked questions. This is a nonverbal person with ID and we had to wait for him to find the answers in the AAC device, and he needed support with his elbow so that he was hitting the thing he really wanted to say. And it was very empowering for him that he, he enjoyed it. They were listening to him. 
So here are examples. The student can introduce themselves, they can talk about their goals, they can review their strengths and limitations, they can discuss their goals. There must be some area in the country where they work on putting the IEP in the form, um, but I've never seen that happen. <laughs> uh, so discussing transition goals, accommodations, and additional services. And I think this has been really important. It's important for at any age, and I think it's important it's even more important that we start early based on my experience with middle school and high school students who may have a higher cognition and they're uncomfortable talking about their disability or they're uncomfortable with their peers. And if they learn very young to be a strong self-advocate, then they go into college, they can go to the disability office and ask for what they need. And um, so it's been really empowering when uh, middle school or high school student needs one-on-one uh, -on -one aid, they need support and they don't want to have it, they don't want it seen. And so, you know, we talk about how the uh, aid could be on the side of the room. When he needs help, he could pull on his ear, you know. what What is it that works for him? And we've come up with ideas we thought were ingenious and this is why you have the student in the room because they didn't like that idea at all. We came up with something better. So. So sounds great, how do I get it? And I'm gonna warn you that I'm moving faster because I'm already running low on time for this section. Um, so you can request self-determination goals, you can request supported decision-making goals, and have the student involved in the IEP process. So evaluations, you can request an evaluation for anything to prepare them for independent living. Um, and here's an example that you will get. I believe my student has limitations in self-determination and supported decision-making uh, that are keeping them back from having educational progress, including preparing them for independent living. Please conduct an evaluation so that we can review the limitations and the outcome. Um, and this, I actually, it's so small. And the last time I did this boot camp, I really wanted to read this and I could not. So um, I want to, give you some really great examples here. So one of the goals here is uh, that the person knows their goal, that they have an AAC visual, that they have staff or parents listen to them, that they have support to meet their goals, that they have choice, um, that they have choice about their supports and services, they have control over directing their lives, that they can make friends, that they can have perspective taking, when they're trying to interact with people and taking a look at what's not working. Um, uh, they can have goals about a job and having personal responsibility. Um, and this is by the Virginia Department of Education and it's a website called imdetermined.org. So I really like these goals, um, especially for people with intellectual disability who often do not know what their goals are and they should have an AAC visual, how empowering is that to know what it is I'm supposed to accomplish at school? So if you don't like the results, you say, I disagree. I still think they have limitations. They need supported decision-making and self-determination evaluation. And therefore, I ask for an independent evaluation at district public expense. So the process here is they can either give you the IEE or they could take you to hearing and they could go to due process. That rarely happens in my experience, but in order for them to do that, they have to have a really great evaluation. They have to show why they're not gonna do the IE and they, they should have a really great assessment that they're gonna defend with that. So self-determination and supported decision-making, make it a goal, having I statements. I'm gonna move faster through here because I wanna make sure you get some other information that plays on this. Um, so here's a behavior goal, and this may be a behavior goal for a higher functioning kid or somebody who needs less support. So everybody's behavior goal is different, but the point is that they have choice and they have input and it's something that they're interested in. So I will pick subjects I'm interested in and write stories using proper grammar in at least three out of four stories. And often, children that have academic studies, uh, uh, struggles, excuse me, um, really have a hard time with the goals and wanting to, to work on reading and math and writing. 
So DC public schools recognize supported decision making. They practice it starting in preschool. They have I statements and they have accountability. They have example supported decision making forms. And I've included the link here, questions and answers, what their supported decision making agreement looks like. And it's what I hope that we start seeing in other places. So please use it as, as an example. Um, so here we are going to actually take a break. We're going to move to transition services after we take a break. Um, so if you can meet me back here um, in 10 minutes, go ahead and have a snack and uh, we'll see you. Thank you.